my name is Jeff Beeson. I will be the host for uh, today's webinar, as well as the other two that we have planned later this week. So as you might have seen when you were signing up, um, this is actually a series. Uh, really, what we're trying to highlight here is how CRISPR and genome engineering can be used um, at all points throughout the, the drug discovery process from discovery to clinic. Um, so today's session, we're focusing on um, CRISPR screening libraries, um, particularly useful if you're doing um, target ID and validation. But then uh, the session tomorrow, once you have some hits that you've um, identified and validated, uh, you'll probably want to characterize those in much more detail. So for that topic, uh, we've got um, knockout, knock-in cell models. Um, one, generating both high quality cell models, uh, but also generating them at a high scale. Um, and then finally, the, the third session on Thursday, um, getting a little bit closer to, to the clinic with um, GMP grade sgRNA. Um, obviously useful if you're doing uh, CRISPR-based um, diagnostics or therapeutics. So, you know, whether one, two, or all three sessions are useful for you, um, we definitely are glad you're here and hope you or your colleagues can join for the sessions uh, later this, this week as well. Um, so, yeah, um, just to introduce uh, Mike here quickly as well. Um, Mike is one of our technical support scientists at Synthigo, and he earned his PhD in chemistry from the University of Mississippi. Uh, later on, he did his postdoc work at Harvard um, and Boston Children's before coming to Synthigo. Um, and again, my name is Jeff. If you haven't met me yet, I am the strategic account manager for Boston. So hopefully there are some uh, Boston Cambridge people on the webinar, in which case, you know, thank you for joining. Um, but obviously plenty of other Synthigo account managers um, around the world. So if anything is interesting today, uh, we definitely encourage you to speak with uh, Mike or one of our other support scientists or myself or one of the other account managers in your area. So with that, I see it's officially five minutes past. We've got 163 people in attendance and I will pass it on to you, Mike, for the presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you to the audience for joining today. Uh, hopefully I could give you some insight on how Synthigo can help with any type of screening libraries, or if you're just plain interested in any type of screening libraries down the road. So as Jeff mentioned, today is just going to be the CRISPR knockout screening session of a three-part series. And let me just slide over to the next slide, making sure I can. All right, there we go. So we're going to go into more detail on how to improve the target identification and validation with the RAID synthetic sgRNAs. But I will take a deeper dive into some of the other methods of either knocking down screens like RNAi, pooled versus array screens, and all of those uh, details that unravel around them. For this actual presentation, there will be four specific parts. First part, we'll go over a loss of function. So it's really going further into what RNI versus CRISPR aspects of things. The next portion of it is going to be the CRISPR screening library, so pooled, pooled uh, screening versus arrayed screening. The next aspect is how do you actually deliver a library inside of cells, going from Lenti versus synthetic guides. And then the last aspect, taking the more deeper dive of how Syndigo could really help you with your screening libraries from start to finish. Before we even dive into CRISPR I or RNAi and CRISPR specifically, why you want to actually do some type of screens is to really understand what a protein's function is within a cell. How does it impact a specific pathway? And more specifically, what happens when you're losing that specific protein or you're knocking it out or silencing that specific protein? And in these cases, it's a loss of function. So you're losing the function of that specific protein to do its actual work downstream after it's being translated into that specific protein. But there are multiple different aspects or different steps that go into creating a protein, going from the DNA level to mRNA to protein itself. And you could target various uh, regions or different steps along the way of knocking out or silencing that specific uh, gene of interest that will be translated into the protein. And two of them are through CRISPR or RNAi. CRISPR really takes a, uh, focuses more on the DNA level, making more of a permanent uh, edit into the genome, while RNAi is more of like a masking element where it's not impacting the genome specifically, but everything that's being transcribed from the DNA to the mRNA level is being impacted by RNAi specifically. And once either of those two assays go through, you're trying to understand what is that protein's function downstream. So, First thing I want to really get into is 
the two different types of functional assays that are out there. You got the binary assays and multiparametric assays. For binary assays, there are a few that come to mind. So the first one that comes to mind is this positive screen. You're identifying various survivors. You're gonna end up applying a selective pressure and the selective pressure is gonna knock out a handful of those specific cells or ones that have that specific uh, edit that knocked out uh, the protein and you see this amplification of expression and you're really focused on those amplified ones or the survivors. The other aspect of binary assays is the negative screen. So you wanna know, all right, you use either CRISPR or RNAi and what happens to the ones that died uh, or the cells that die after the RNAi RNAi or CRISPR are introduced. So you have to actually have a control and then the ones that have that selective pressure. The control is to understand, all right, once you apply the selective pressure, you're gonna have the handful of subset of cells that die off and the ones that survive. And you're gonna do a comparison. So the ones that survived and the control, you can identify which ones actually died off and do your further assessment or assays uh, down the road from there. And then the last one here is just assays that enable any type of fluorescence or cell signaling or cell sorting. So it's really just expressions of surface markers or expression of reporter proteins like GFP is a very common one to really go into fluorescence or GFP uh, M cherry is another one. But a lot of these are just yes, no, zeros and ones, black or white. While multiparametic have a little bit more detail, a little bit more in depth that you can actually understand with your screens. So one of the first components of a multiparametic assay is the high content imaging. So you can understand cell morphology, cellular uptake, are proteins localizing in certain regions of the actual cell themselves specifically. You can really go into, all right, protein abundance. You can do ELISA assays, luciferase assays, beta galacta beta gal or mass spectrometry, you can do Western blast from there just to see if there's actually expression, amplification, or a decrease of actual expression from there. And then the last one is just time course monitoring of cell processing. So all right, how is differentiation uh, affected by RNAi or CRISPR? How, how is uh, migration or phagocytosis really impacted by this uh, knockout or removal of this protein for the cell to actually proceed into just life or the circle of life at that point. But as I was discussing earlier on a previous slide, maybe the two ones we would want to focus on today are just RNAi versus CRISPR specifically. So RNAi really utilizes the RNA-induced silencing complex or risk, which you can actually see here. Where's my arrow? Whoops. There we go. You see the red dot there? Perfect. All right, so that's that uh, risk component. It's a multi-complex, specifically ribonucleoproteins, uh, which function in gene silencing via a variety of pathways at the transcriptional and translational level. Using single-stranded RNA, such as microRNA or double-stranded small interfering RNAs, siRNA, the complex functions as a key role tool in gene regulation. The single stranded of RNA acts as a template for risk or the RNA. RISC to recognize complementary messenger RNA that are coming from the nucleus that are being transcribed from the, um, from the genome uh, all the way over to the mRNA level, which want to go or proceed onto the peptide sequence or being translated into a peptide and eventual protein, but maybe risk can actually interfere with all that. So once, uh, once found, one of the proteins in risk actually cleaves the mRNA that is complementary to that single-stranded or double-stranded uh, RNA and really prevent further uh, really translation of that specific protein itself. The other aspect of this is CRISPR, where Synthego can really come into handy there. So uh, for CRISPR itself, there's two major components. You got, in this case, you got Cas9 on the screen with the guide RNA. And inside of the cell will form an RNP complex. And that guide RNA is actually going to direct the Cas9 to a specific region in the genome where it's complementary. And once that region is identified, specifically making sure the PAM sequence and the complementary strand are identified, it's going to induce a double strand break. And this double strand break will end up creating either some type of frame shift and insertion of base pairs, deletions of base pairs, 
crossing your fingers if there's a stop code on to prevent further translation or hopefully disrupting any type of uh, sequence, downstream sequence of where that cut site is located that will either alter the peptide translation, creating this irregular peptide that you can actually see here. You want to uh, get rid of that or not actually having the expression of the peptide itself specifically. So these two are the main factors that can really go into what type of screens you want to do down the road. There are benefits and drawbacks to both RNAi and CRISPR-based screens, but both the drawbacks and benefits must really be considered when you're designing your specific experiments for, um, for your screens specifically. RNAi is a very common technique that uh, really just represses a lot of the expression, but really isn't impacting the actual DNA level specifically, while CRISPR impacts the actual genome specifically or the DNA specifically, which can be a little bit more beneficial uh, down the road for you. But if you're only wanting to just alter any type of expression at a very temporary level, maybe RNAi might be a beneficial way, but if those of you who are familiar with the CRISPR toolbox, you can actually create CRISPR-I. CRISPR-I is CRISPR interference, which actually brought, blocks the actual uh, transcription of a specific gene, which can actually be a little bit more specific binding compared to RNAi, and a little bit more uh, beneficial for any type of screens. But between the two here that I really wanna focus in on is that RNAi is more associated with more of off-target effects. Uh, CRISPR is a little bit more specific. You have the PAM, se PAM sequence that is a little, uh, focused a little bit more of directing uh, the editing, uh, you, the PAM specific sequence for that specific nuclease uh, prevents this we weirdness or off-target editing that could possibly uh, be occurring. And more so if you want to actually focus on drug screens and how knocking out a specific uh, gene of interest uh, plays into this. So mimicking any type of therapies or what you're seeing in the clinic, CRISPR may be a more beneficial route compared to RNAi because you're going to have to constantly be repressing or using RNAi or introducing uh, RNA into the actual, uh, um, into the cells compared to CRISPR, which is more permanent compared to RNAi. CRISPR screens are available in two real major formats, the pooled versus array, and choosing which format to use may depend on several different factors. But you also got to ask yourself, all right, which one is really beneficial for myself? So for assay compatibility, does my assay work if I use this screen format? Type of data analysis, so like what type of stuff do you really want to do? What type of readouts do you expect from these specific screens? Is Will this screen answer my questions? And screening prep setup, what are the challenges needed? Do you have to really optimize your workflow conditions initially, or do you just want to really bombard cells and see what happens at the very end of it? It's really up to you, but you really want to choose wisely what you want to proceed with because it can really impact what your research is doing, what the readouts are for that specific assay that you're trying to do. And really, like all these screens are impacting the world in specific ways. So Choosing wisely is very important. For this talk specifically, we're going to go over two different uh, screening as or screening uh, workflows here. We're going to go over the pool versus arrayed. And for this slide specifically, I just want to show you the different comparisons, the different workflows that you're seeing from left to right. So on the left hand side, you're going to be starting. Where's my mouse here? Left-hand side, you're going to have to uh, construct whatever library you're going to be doing. You have to really figure out, all right, what's your delivery method? Like, that is actually very important. How am I going to, like, actually make genome edits? How am I going to deliver stuff inside of cells or your samples or whatever it may be? But then, all right, once you actually deliver everything, what, like, what's the readout? What's, what's going to happen at that point? So you got to really understand what type of screens and selection stuff you're going to do following that delivery of their transduction, uh, transfection, and then how are you really going to analyze this? So how are you going to validate it? How do you know if it actually worked? So there are very aspects that you really have to understand during these specific workflows. And I'll take a deeper dive into each of these in the next two slides here. So I'm going to break it down into four major components 
for both the pooled and array libraries. So we're going to start off here. Uh, here we go. Start off here with the library construction, library delivery selection, and the actual analysis portion itself, starting with the pool screening workflows. You can either select plasmas, including uh, encoding sgRNA, our PCR amplified and validated via NGS to ensure that equal representation is maintained. <clears throat> Excuse me. Plasmas are then packaged into lentiviral uh, particles, preferably one guide for a vector containing a selection marker, and that's usually antibody resistant genes. And there's typically more than one sgRNA designed per gene. Uh, to increase confidence in the genotype and phenotype correlation of what you're actually seeing downstream from uh, after, after the transduction. And then the libraries can also be purchased and prepackaged. So if you really don't want to create these viral packages on their own, then a lot of other vendors or other companies could possibly make these viral packages for you. Um, so you could look into those aspects. Um, but the next is how do you actually deliver these viral packages inside of the cell specifically? So viral particles are then introduced to a single group of cells. So they're not individual wells. It's usually in one specific plate itself, itself. And you actually want to have a low multiplicity of infection to ensure that on average, only one viral particle will enter each cell and insert the sgRNA sequence into the genome. You can either use Cas9 uh, expressing cell lines or co-transduction of Cas9 to actually introduce uh, sgRNA and Cas9 to allow uh, the further editing at that point. The populations are then enriched for successful transduced cells. Uh, this usually through an antibody selection and subsequent, subsequently expanded at that point. Cells then can be proliferated, passed on, and the sRNA sequences are the ones that you wanna see in the successive uh, generations or the stuff that proceeds after those generations. In the selection aspect of this workflow specifically, uh, for pooled screens, you're really limited on just a positive or negative type of selections. Uh, so for positive and negative selection pressures, when they are applied, you can select for whatever desired, uh, desired viability phenotype. For positive selections, you're identifying knockoffs that provide a growth advantage in the presence of the selective agent. Whereas a negative selection identifies a knockout that confers a survival disadvantage in the presence of the selective agent. That's where for the negative, uh, the negative selections, you wanna have a control because your main focus are the cells that are dying off. So in this case specifically, you see here on the negative selection aspect, you have the applied selection press pressure. These will have the survivors while you also have this control on the left-hand side. And you're gonna compare both of them once you start going into the analysis aspect. And then as mentioned, the analysis aspect, the uh, frequency of each guide RNA in the cell population is measured before and after the selection. Because the sgRNAs were integrated into the genome of the cells, they can be measured by next generation sequencing or NGS. The enrichment or depletion of particular sgRNA following the selection implicates gene perturbation that desensitized or sensitized cells to the selective agent. Note that identifying in relative abundance of the sgRNA in the manipulated cell population is the readout and not the edits made to the targeted genes. Now the fun aspect of arrayed workflows, so arrayed library specifically, and you could have multiple different types of delivery methods. I won't go into too much detail about the lentivirus delivery because I went over that over in a previous slide there, but there's other methods of delivery either through plasmids or synthetic guides that you're seeing here on the library constructs. There's my mouse, there we go. Uh, the library construct of plasmids, which you do have to sort of design on your own or synthetic guides or oligos or single stranded guides. And you're gonna have to end up first arrayed specifically. In this case, you're gonna only have one gene per well or one specific gene you're targeting per well in either a 96 well played, 384 well played or larger at that point. And then once you actually have each of the genes targeting or you identified what wells, making sure you label uh, what wells uh, has the target of the gene of interest at that point, you can either transfect with either the Cas9 and uh, the sgRNA, you could transduce if you're doing the lentiviral delivery methods into Cas9 expressing cells, 
or you can do the co-transduction or co-transfection with the um, Cas9 itself too, just so that the RMP complex is actually forming within the cells and really targeting uh, the specific region of the genome. Because if you don't have one or the other, there isn't gonna, one or the other, meaning the guide RNA or the Cas9 at some capacity, you're really not gonna see any type of editing. You're just gonna be pretty much doing a control experiment. So making sure both of them are together is very essential, either in Cas9 expressing cells or together with uh, co-transfection or transduction at that point. For the selection aspect, since you know each of the wells that you targeted, or each well has a specific gene, you can identify, all right, how is this cell reacting to when this gene is specifically knocked out? This is where those multi-parameters uh, 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 multi uh, screens or assays that you can actually develop of either fluorescence, you can actually assess, uh, is there expression of a specific gene specific or protein specifically uh, using like Western blot or ELISA, you can assess the morphology, are cells proliferating at a slower rate or proliferating faster? All that type of assessment needs to go further down into the analysis portion. And even before, a lot of this stuff is like looking at the more external aspect or looking outside of um, what the actual edits that actually occurred. We always really wanna emphasize try to genotype it at some level or try to assess at some type of level. I know that it'll vary depending on the size of the libraries because it may not even be beneficial. It's not gonna be worth your time. It's gonna be too much. It's not gonna be implemented in your workflow. But when you're optimizing, doing some type of sequencing aspect to understand that CRISPR editing is occurring allows you to actually proceed to these larger screens to do those or have confidence that the larger screens that you're doing the phenotype that you're visibly seeing is a true phenotype, either through a Western blot expression or the morphology of the actual cells themselves. For both pooled screens and arrayed screens, there are benefits, there are drawbacks, but you really have to gauge on which one will benefit either your lab specifically, the workflow that uh, you're doing uh, in your lab and what downstream assessments are. The two, I do have a handful out of these lists. I'll let you guys read for a majority of them, but there's a couple of them that stand out to me specifically is really uh, the, what is it? Uh, for pool screen specifically, it does not require specific equipment or specialized equipment. I know that's in the benefits section for pool screens right now, but it is sort of a drawback too, because you're gonna need specialized labs because you are delivering via a viral vector at that point. So you gotta have that biosafety aspect of it, even if you don't, may not have like an electroporator or a nuclear effector at that uh, realm. While an arrayed screen, you may not need that biosafety uh, like level lab as you would for a viral vector uh, delivery in like a pooled screen, you might need those instrumentations such as a nuclear effector or electroporator for your specific screens. The other drawback for the pool screens, I do want to point out, so that pool screens specifically, they're not really not really beneficial for primary cells or cells that are not dividing, um, just because you want to see like the subsequent uh, div uh, proliferations or divisions from there is to see if the actual guys have been integrated, if there is any type of edits downstream from there, while arrayed screens may be a little bit more beneficial that more wider range of cells that they, you can specifically work with. And like more specifically primary cells and neurons. But I did do pros and cons. A lot of times you wanna be looking at the readout specifically. So for pooled screens and array screens, all the stuff that you see a nice green check mark or stuff that those two uh, screens can do specifically that Arrayed screens can do all of the ones listed, such as cell viability, cell morphology, time course studies, biochemical assay readouts. While you're really limited just for the black or white, yes or no type answers for the pooled screens. So pooled screens, cell viability, are they growing fast or are they growing slow? Cell proliferations, like how are the cells really doing? Uh, synthetic lethality, are they dead or alive? Like it, it's the yes or no answer. And that may not be beneficial for all screens. Um, 
maybe if you're just trying to do a simple, simple understanding of a gene that way, but there might be other benefits that you can use with an array screen specifically that can already be used uh, for the pool screen, but array covers all of that. And just to jump in here with a, a few quick comments, if you want to go back to the glass of mic, this is kind of the, uh, the main point of consideration oftentimes when I talk with researchers is they, they might be using a certain cell type or a certain assay um, because they've been using pooled and they assume that they need to stick with it. But if they're, if you have been working with immortalized cells and you want to work with primary cells, for example, or if you've been doing these basic binary assays and you want a more complex readout, those are possible if you want to make that switch from pooled to arrayed. Um, and then, on that note, before we move on to the next section here, um, I trust we'll have a few minutes left for Q&A at the end, but there are a couple popped up that I think would be good um, during this section right now. Um, let's see here. One is um, how will we design the, the sgRNA? Um, short answer is that if you're working with Cynthia, we can definitely help you out with that. Either there's a design tool on our website, or if you want to check out our multi-guide approach, which I believe Michael will go into later, then those are kind of pre-designed for you. Uh, and then that same person had a few other questions about a uh, delivery method uh, regarding lentiviral vectors, for example. And I think Mike's going to go into that in the next section. So I'll just let him handle that throughout the presentation. Um, another one that's uh, probably worth noting here is someone asked, if they have a Cas9 enzyme instead of Cas9 expressing cells, can you transfect in the RMP complex? Uh, and the short answer is, is yes. And again, I'm sure Mike will go into this in more detail, but if you want to use um, say synthetic um, sgRNA, for example, obviously it needs to get bound to the, the Cas9 RNA somehow, or sorry, the, sorry, the, the Cas9 protein somehow. Um, some people already have Cas9 expressing cells, that's great. Um, or if you wanna try and transfect in the Cas9 protein with the, the sgRNA, that's an option too. Um, one other one that I think I'll let Mike handle here. Um, question is, is there a selection step needed for the arrayed format and what ranges of transfection or rather editing efficiency are typical? So for, uh, for actual arrayed screens for a selection marker, it's not necessarily a thing that you really need specifically. Um, if you use Synthigo's arrayed screening libraries, that you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't need it for the actual cells. Of course, you might want to have like an antibiotic in there to like get rid of any bacterial growth. But for actual selection purposes for the actual assay themselves, you wouldn't need one sp like specifically for an arrayed screen library if you're using synthetic guys. And then what was that other component, Jeff? Uh, typical ranges for transfection or editing efficiencies. I think we'll, you'll probably go into this more um, when you talk about maybe the transfection optimization kit or the multi-guide kit. But yeah. long story short, when researchers work with um, our, our RMPs, um, at least in our hands, um, with our protocols, we get an average knockout efficiency of 80% without selection. Mm -hmm. um, and as a minimum, we recommend that customers optimize transfection efficiencies or trans transfection conditions to get editing efficiency at least uh, 50%. Um, but I'm sure we'll probably naturally answer some of these questions more in the next section. So in the interest of time, we'll just uh, keep things mov moving along here. Yes, and just foreshadowing here, like there is a slide that goes over that, uh, just probably 10 slides from here, 10 or 11 slides. So just stay tuned for that one answer to that one actually specifically. All right, so next aspect or next component of this uh, webinar series, we're gonna go into just one or two slides on the lenti versus synthetic guides. We're diving a little bit deeper, we're gonna do lentivirus versus synthetic guides specifically. So for a lentivirus, you're actually designing a, a viral particle to carry the guide uh, or transgene integration into the genome for stable expression. There are some benefits. They're efficient for delivery and they have a low cytotoxicity. Uh, for drawbacks, you need that extra safety. I addressed that earlier. You needed that extra like biosafety labs to make sure they're not going all over the place. They're a little bit laborious to prep um, unless you're willing to go out and have some other vendor uh, design and actually package all of the viral loads for you specifically. Uh, a lot of times you have to stable expression may increase off-target effects, may not be beneficial. Um, you may see some irregularities or false positive, false negatives because of these off-target effects. 
there can also be possible random integration of the lantivirus into the genome. It may dis disrupt other genes of interest. And again, that's where you might see false positives, false negatives at that aspect may not be beneficial. And for amenability for the cell type, it's immortalized cell lines, primary cells for arrays only and iPSCs. Comparing it to synthetic guides, uh, synthetic guides are just a single guide RNA. So that's the CRISPR and tracer RNA. Uh, Synthigo does offer the full length guide specifically. You don't have to do any additional annealing steps. For the benefits for synthetic guides, they usually have a high editing efficiency. Uh, that is really dependent on if you have your workflow optimized, uh, just troubleshooting. We'll go a little bit more detail in the uh, preceding slides from here. Uh, you will. We do see some benefits actually, including a chemical modification. So it'll actually minimize uh, any type of immune response of the cells of having these types of chemical modifications. And for RNP delivery, so when I say RNP, it's uh, the ribonucleo complex, uh, protein complex uh, that's being delivered. So that's the synthetic guide and the nuclease themselves. They are transient, they will degrade over time. So there isn't really an integration of it. So RNP transfection reduces the off-target effects that you may see with the lentivirus specifically. Drawbacks, it is you do have to optimize specifically with whatever workflow you're doing, if it's lipofection, nucleofection, or electroporation, um, there are various types of positive controls, negative controls that can be used for these types of optimization steps. And again, I'll go into this a little bit further on what type of controls can be used for your optimization aspect. For amenable cells, you can actually have the immortalized cells, primary cells, and IPSC specifically. But there are benefits, there are drawbacks to both of them. It really depends on the type of cells you're doing, type of readouts you're trying to really understand. And both of them really need to be, cons be considered when you're designing your actual screens. However, lentiviral is traditionally more common. However, more con uh, however, they have had concerns that are addressed, uh, the synthetic guides have addressed specifically. So Jeff, are you gonna say something? Yeah, I suppose. Um, do we have a poll question now or is that coming on later? No, it's, it's later on. Okay, um, I guess the, uh, the one comment I would, um, or the little bit of context I would add about uh, Lenti versus synthetic is, you know, thinking about how well you can trust your downstream assays. Because mm -hmm. you know, when you make a CRISPR knockout and you, you see some, some output in whatever assay you're using, you know, how do you know that the phenotype you see is the result of your intended knockout and not some you know, a random vector integration or not some off-target effect or, uh, or not some you know, altered cell behavior because of uh, antibiotics, for example. So in my opinion, the synthetic approach tends to be a bit cleaner um, and it just gives you a little bit more trust in the results from your downstream assays that you're not seeing some false positives from, from vector integration, for example. All right, so the next aspect of the last phase of this webinar specifically is taking a more deeper dive into the RAID CRISPR screening libraries. It's really where Synthigo can come in and help you with your specific screens or any type of screens. And we're here to help you at all steps along the way for your screening libraries, starting from those optimization steps all the way up to the validating targets. To carry on what I was saying on the previous slide of those optimization steps, that was a drawback specifically. I work on tech support. I do get a lot of uh, emails from customers asking or researchers asking about, I'm having issues trying to optimize, can you help me out? So feel free at any point, reach out to support at synthigo.com and we're willing to help you out for the optimization aspect of it. But to more give you a little tidbit of what really we recommend to start off with the optimization aspect because actually doing the experiments is quite essential is finding a right control, finding a proper control for your screens at the very beginning stages. So I'm not asking, start doing a library, have like a 96 or a 384 well plate ready to go with a boatload of uh, positive controls on it. And maybe just like one or two uh, controls themselves like Rayla, 
uh, track specifically for human, Rosa 26 for mouse are really common ones that uh, we can help you along the way at Synthego, but ones that are common uh, mainly in the research uh, world specifically. But you do need specific controls to understand how is the editing efficiency for your type of edit? How is the delivery method? Is it actually get the material or RMP complex being uh, introduced inside the cells? So I do recommend having a negative and a positive control. And the negative control is going to either be a transfection with the no guides or no cast nine. So it's one or the other, not both of them together. So no guides can actually be just a scramble RNA. Synthigo does offer two different types of negative controls. Or if you want to just deliver the Cas9 or the component that's actually making the edit to the genome or edit to the actual DNA specifically, you can deliver that. But do not deliver both of them. And this allows you to establish a baseline of you deliver these inside of the cells. They should be acting like the wild type after transfection. So you could have a parental line or a cell line that doesn't go through any transfection methods. And then you can have your editing negative controls that do go through the transfection workflow. And, and the final outcome should be that they, they should be really acting very similar to each other because there isn't any genome editing for the one that went through the transfection. And of course, the one that didn't go through the transfection, uh, it should be acting normal. The other aspect or the other control we recommend is having some type of positive control. So track or other validated guides that you know consistently at time after time make some type of editing. This allows you to understand, all right, when I say editing, it's actually doing the CRISPR, like some type of insertion, deletion after the transfection themselves, and you know it'll work. It allows you to understand, do I have to increase the amount of guides? Do we have to decrease the amount of Cas9 being entered? True, really trying to understand how can I improve my actual editing efficiency. And to bring back the optimization aspect, I do recommend starting off with at least one of those, uh, at least having one positive, one negative control specifically before you start jumping into the large libraries of 500 genes or 1,000 or whatever your, like the whole human genome for, forever that may be. Like start off very simple before you end up proceeding on. So you got to walk before you can start running a marathon. Yeah, on that note, I just want to make sure that someone in the chat had their question answered. I think the question was about uh, methods that are compatible with transduction of sgRNA. Um, and the short answer is that um, our customers report using a variety of methods. So lipofection, electroporation, nucleofection. Uh, we have a transfection optimization kit and some gene knockout kits to, to help you optimize in tube format before scaling up. Um, but yeah, long story short, um, you don't necessarily need access to a nuclear effector, although, you know, that might give you better efficiencies, but if, you know, light perfection is all you have to work with, that, that probably should do the trick as long as you tweak some conditions and get decent editing efficiency. Anything else you want to add on that point, Mike, regarding choice of transfection methodology? It's what type of resources you have access to. All right. If you have access to an electroporator, like by all means, we have protocols on our website for electroporation. If you have a nuclear effector accessibility, we got nuclear affection protocols for you. If you have neither, maybe lipofection might be a beneficial route because you don't need electroporation or nuclear effector or electroporators or nuclear or nuclear effectors for that matter. So once you actually optimize your transfection conditions. So like you have the highest editing efficiency you could possibly get with the positive controls that you know work time after time, such as track. We do have an op optimization kit as Jeff was mentioning before. But before we even start scaling up to any type of place or any type of libraries uh, for that matter, why not test single individual tubes or genes that you kind of want to target for that larger library down the road just to see if the actual delivery method for the arrayed screens or the transfection methods that you just optimized are going to work for these genes specifically. And the beauty of this is that Synthigo does have guide designs already made for you for all the protein coding genes of the human and mouse genome specifically. And you can utilize single individual gene knockout kits or single tubes that Jeff was mentioning and transfect and see how the editing is for those specific genes before you start scaling up even further from there. But taking a deeper dive into what these gene knockout kits or the synthetic sgRNA designs we have specifically for gene knockout kits and libraries too. 
So for the G knockout kits and all of our libraries, there are Syndigo's unique multi-guide designs that our bioinformatics team made sure that they had a high on-target editing for that specific region, low off-target editing, making sure it hits all of the different major transcripts that are present all throughout uh, that specific gene of interest. There are up to three specific guides. So when we say three guides, um, there can be two guides in the kits. There can be one guide in that specific kit. But our bioinformatics team did their uh, create an algorithm that ensures that there will be a knockout for that specific gene of interest if it's one, two, or three guides specifically. All of these guides do end up directing the nuclease, in this case, the SPCAS9 nuclease to the region of the DNA or the region of the gene of interest. And it will induce the double strand break. And when these work concurrently or together or in a mixing match of guide one working with guide three, you're gonna create one or more 21 plus fragment deletions. So these guides, they're very beneficial. They work in very high efficiency. They work together. They may mix and match with each other, but they are very beneficial. And, and of course, I could be saying that right now. I do have data to show you this in uh, just a few seconds here. Once you actually make some type of in, um, CRISPR edit, you're going to have an insertions, deletions. Um, you actually want to figure out, is there going to be a functional knockout? And these guides or the gene knockout kits and the multi-guide design approach increases the probability of a functional knockout. And I really want to emphasize probability of a knockout in the graphs that I'll be showing in these in the next couple of seconds here. And the last component is they do minimize the off-target editing. And when I say minimizing off-target editing, it's because they're actually a proprietary blend and there's a smaller amount. So like the total concentration for these specific guys, I'll use one gene knockout kit is 1.5 nanomole. You might have, it's gonna be 0.5 of one guide, 0.5 of another guide, 0.5 of another guide, adding up to that 1.5 nanomole. So it's not really all specifically or all heavily concentrated of the guys where it could start editing in various parts of that genome. And the last component is, the guys are not stacked up on each other like pancakes because that just means they're going to be competing with each other. They are logistically or strategically designed to be spaced out to create these fragment deletions when they're transfected inside of the cells that you are specifically doing, targeting that gene of interest. And there was additional uh, experimentation that I will show you on this slide in the next one. And just to give you a little bit more uh, information on this is the knockout score seen on the Y axis. That is actually a correlation to our bioinformatics tool ICE, the inference of CRISPR edits, which can be used for any type of assessments down the road for once you do your CRISPR edit, you want to understand what type of um, edit actually occurred in the uh, samples. You extract the samples, you do your genotyping, um, your, your genotype, then you sequence using Sanger sequencing, and you can actually upload those sequence files into the ICE bioinformatics tool, and it can give you a knockout score. So that ties in what increased probability of a functional knockout. Since you're doing sequencing, you're looking at the DNA level and not looking at the specific protein, the knockout score is just a probability or what are the chances that you will see a specific knockout for that specific gene of interest. So in this case, going comparing just the individual guides themselves seen in gray on the left-hand side of the graph compared to the multi-guide approach on the right-hand side of the graph in green, that you actually have a higher knockout score or a higher probability or higher chance that you will see a protein knockout once you do either a fax, screen, Western blot, ELISA, whatever those screens are, just understand will that protein be knocked out for you compared to the individual guides themselves. Yeah, before we move on, just one quick thing I want to clarify on the slide and also a question in the chat I want to address quickly as well. Um, when people traditionally do uh, CRISPR knockouts, they're making indels, small insertions or deletions of just a couple uh, nucleotides. But I really want to emphasize that an indel does not necessarily mean a knockout. So, for example, if uh, you come in with a single guide and you get a minus three deletion, great. Technically, CRISPR did its job. But 
at minus three, the protein is still in frame. You haven't actually created a functional knockout. And that's one of the great things about this multi-gat approach is that, um, again, like Mike mentioned, they're not kind of like stacked on top of each other. There really is a very particular spacing and orientation that our bioinformatics, that our bioinformatics team uh, designed where you're going to get this deletion or this fragment deletion of about 50 or 150 base pairs. So 150, for example, it's divisible by three. Technically, the protein is still in frame. But when you're removing such a large chunk, you're much more likely to get a functional knockout at the protein level, not just getting some in-frame indel at the DNA level. Um, but anyway, I see we're uh, a bit pressed on time here. So let's see if we can uh, race through the last few slides. And I guess we'll, we'll bleed over the top of the hour for some Q&A but at least finish the, the presentation in the next four or five minutes here. Yeah, that works with me, Jeff. Thanks for the time crunch there. But the next aspect is, all right, we actually take a couple of our genes of interest. In this case, it's the ALPK, uh, JAK1, and the NUAK2. And we actually tested the individual guys themselves compared to the multi-guide approach. And you can see here, individual guides did not stack up well compared to the multi-guide for comparing or when comparing to that knockout score specifically. So it really shows that multi-guide sgRNA yield a higher, uh, higher indel frequency compared to the individual components of the sgRNA. But okay, great. We've done a lot of stuff on the sequencing aspect. We've told you, or I've told you a lot about the sequencing aspect of, or looking at the DNA level, showing you those knockout scores. What is actually happening to the protein? Because at the end of the day, we want to see like protein depletion. We want to get rid of that protein specifically. And taking a little bit more of those genes or taking some genes that we used with and found within our multi-guide approach here, such as CNN1, GLO1, BLML, BLMH, Rayleigh, and the UCHL2, or it's UCL3, uh, you can see there is protein depletion. So backing things up just a little bit, protein extraction was taken seven days, 14 days, and 21 days after transfection. The control experiments were using just a negative control that we offer at Syndigo, one of the sgRNA negative controls. And we did a comparison after those specific days. And you can see compared to the controls for 7, 14, and 21 days that there is a protein knockout for each of these genes specifically using our multi-guide approach. Really ensuring that the multi-guide does knock out the genes. It's really creating these large fragment deletions. And we always want to make sure fragment deletions are happening and there is some type of effect of that protein that could actually help you with your assay screens because you don't want those false positives, false negatives, just because you had a minus three or a factor of three uh, CRISPR added insertion or deletion um, because it's not really creating a frame shift deletion. The last aspect of this is going in a little bit more detail. This is really going to answer that question from uh, before going into detail. What happens when you miniaturize an assay? So like maybe instead of the single individual guys for the gene knockout case, why don't you take a smaller library? In this case, there were 86 different uh, genes of interest that we use. And we can see that 77 of those genes, 77 of the 86 genes specifically, show some type of knockout. Those other ones that we see here on the right-hand side, uh, there, there isn't any sequencing there specifically, or there isn't any data there specifically. And a lot of times it could be from poor quality, sequencing quality, or there, there was irregularities in the results that our ICE bioinformatics tool was not able to assess. But with all of these 77 genes that you're able to actually see on average 70 75 percent of those uh or of those 77 genes on average they had a 75 percent knockout score so they have that probability 75 percent probability of actually creating that knockout that you are interested in and showing that it does have a high editing efficiency, does have a possibility that that gene will be knocked out for you, for you to actually have confidence moving on to your actual downstream assays, downstream screens that you're gonna be doing. So after you do those miniaturized assays, you really wanna focus in on identifying the different targets and you wanna be able to quickly and easily uh, identify either false negatives or data that really just doesn't look right to you at that point and either redo those specific assays, redo those specific genes to confirm what you're actually visibly seeing before you actually move into the actual validating targets and the downstream assays that you're really focused in on. And 
we really want to emphasize to you is that Syndigo is here for you at all parts of this library screens, especially when it comes to a raised screen specifically. It can be the actual larger aspect, the larger screens where you're having plates and you're trying to validate your specific genes, or even just at the more simple part of just optimizing your uh, transfection conditions, optimizing your workflow specifically. We're here for you. We want to make sure everything uh, works for your experiments, helping you in your lab, having, helping you and your researchers, and either clinicians or therapies that you're trying to create. We've got a resource library and some bioinformatics tools, a lot of free resources on our site just to help you get started. Uh, and then Mike, if you go, go to the next slide, if you are, if you do have some more con concrete plans, even if you're, you're six, 12 months out, but certainly if you have some plans within the next three months, definitely get in touch. Um, if you've kind of already got some ongoing experiments, especially with Synthigo's reagents, uh, reach out to support at synthigo.com. You'll get connected with Mike or someone else on our tech support team. I'm happy to help you out with uh, the tools and the resources that, that Synthigo has. Um, or if you're a little bit earlier on, um, go to synthigo.com slash discovery. Um, that'll bring you to a calendar page. You can set up a call with uh, me if you're in the Boston area, uh, or that'll connect you with um, your local account manager if you're located elsewhere. Um, so with that, um, I know we're at the top of the hour now, so I'm totally understandable if some people need to get going. I think we can stick around for an ex extra, uh, I don't know, five or 10 minutes, just in case there are some other questions, if people have time to, to stick around for a bit. Uh, but just want to say thank you once again to everyone for tuning in. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll go through the chat now, since I know there were quite a few questions that I, I wasn't able to keep up with. So we'll see how many we can answer now. I do wanna thank the audience. Thank you so much for your time. I know everyone has busy schedules. I know it's another Zoom meeting, another Zoom link. Um, I really appreciate your attendance for this. And by all means, like reach out to support at synthigo.com. I have amazing colleagues. They are very quick at responding, very knowledgeable. So support at synthigo.com. We're very fast and we wanna help you as much as possible. Awesome. So in no particular order with the questions, if I don't get to your question, um, please don't take it personally. Again, you know, we have a, a tech support team. So if we're not able to get to everything, feel free to reach out afterwards. But just going over some of the more popular questions right now. Um, let's see here. Someone had asked, uh, where can I find the list of genes slash sgRNA available with Synthio? Um, so the short answer is we have guide RNA, uh, these multi-guide kits available for every gene in the human and mouse genomes. Um, if you are interested in a, a small number, if you just want to get some kits and you want to do knockouts in two format, um, you can go onto our website. We have a gene knockout kit, again, using that proprietary multi-guide approach. Um, it's super easy. You just select your genome, either human or mouse, select your gene, kit pops up. The, the three guide RNAs are, are pre-designed um, and you're all set to go. Or if you are interested in doing a larger library screen, um, you will see a list on our website of some pre-made libraries, um, at least just kind of a high level overview, whether it's the whole human genome or the druggable genome or you know, particular families like, uh, like kinases, for example. Um, the specific list of genes isn't disclosed on the website, but again, that's what I'm here for or your local account manager. Uh, we're happy to chat in more detail. Um, let's see here. But Jeff, that's not to say that you can't create your own library too. Like if you have like a certain set of genes, um, we have something called our on-demand libraries and starting with a minimum of 20 genes specifically, you can create any type of library in the 96 or 3 to 4 well format um, and working with the account manager such as Jeff or any anyone else that's either on the, uh, the Bay Area or anywhere else, like you do have that option too. Yeah. So I see at least one person here uh, who's relatively new to CRISPR. So I guess I just want to clarify um, that workflow for, for getting up and running. Um, really good starting point um, if you want to try out this synthetic sgRNA, especially in the multi-guided uh, design, is we have a transfection optimization kit. So it's essentially some positive control guide RNA. You can test out a few different transfection conditions with whatever protocol choice, either light perfection, electroporation, nucleofection, um, our customers report getting good editing with a variety of transfection methods. But in any case, with that transfection optimization kit, you just transfect in that positive control guide RNA. As long as you get some decent editing efficiency, I would say very minimum of 50%, then you can move on to your genes of interest. Um, again, in tube format with the gene knockout kit or scaling up more into those libraries that you know plate either 96 or 384 well plates 
with synthetic guide RNA in each bone of the plate, um, either off the shelf, our standard libraries, or as Mike mentioned, if you have a, a specific list of, of hits that you want to validate, uh, we can manufacture these libraries on demand for you. Uh, to also add to that, Jeff, uh, for the transfection optimization kit, it's actually a little bit more unique where we provide you the primer sequences, the sequencing primers and Cas9. So it's everything included for you to get going. So you don't have to buy additional stuff down the road. You don't have to buy additional Cas9. Everything should be included in the transfection optimization kit. But please note that primer sequences and Cas9 are not included for the gene knockout kits or the library specifically, it's only in the transfection optimization kits. Yep, yep, good point. Um, another question here, maybe a point to clarify is, um, someone asked if all three guides should be expressed in the same uh, lentiviral vector or plasmid, or if we should express each guide individually. So I do wanna clarify that this multi-guide approach is only using synthetic sgRNA. Um, that being said, I think, you know, if you're shopping around, you probably will see some other options for like these so-called multi-guide approaches with vectors, but that there is a, a, a distinct difference between how Synthigo designs the multi-guide approach versus um, others. As Mike pointed out, we've got a pretty sophisticated bioinformatics and there really is a specific spacing and orientation that allows us to have that synergistic effect um, where in a lot of cases we find that the multi-guide approach, at least our multi-guide approach, you actually get better knockout efficiency than even the best guide. So um, like the sum is greater than the individual part, so to speak. On the other hand, um, I think sometimes you do see people take, or they try to take a multi-guide approach, but if you just kind of take three random guides, dump them together, they're not gonna have that synergistic approach. It's a, you're kind of rolling the dice, hoping that at least one of the guides works, um, but they're not gonna work better in combination like, like you see with ours. So yeah, just to clarify again, uh, no vectors here, this multi-guide approach that Synthigo offers um, is just with synthetic sgRNA. If you were to do it yourself and create your own synthetic multi-guide approach, we do recommend uh, assessing the editing efficiency of each of those guides that you're gonna be using, the three guides uh, individually and then combined together. Sort of like how I did that bar, the bar graph that was presented where each individual guide showing the editing efficiency compared to multiple, multiple guides uh, being transfected just to see all right is one of the guys actually showing no editing efficiency it wouldn't make sense to include that for the actual experimental transfections that you're going to be doing just because if there's no actual transfection efficiency uh, or editing efficiency there is not a point to have that guide in that uh, transfections mm -hmm. yep uh, another good question here is someone asked if we make a uh, whole genome strna libraries and the answer is absolutely yes uh, we can you know, help you out whether you want to knock out one, 10, uh, or even thousands of genes. So we can go, you know, individual tubes with uh, those knockout kits, or on the other end of the spectrum, we can make whole human or, or, or whole mouse genome libraries, or anywhere in between, either with our standard off-the-shelf libraries, if there's kind of a pre-made gene family that you're interested in, or those, those custom libraries, if you have a very specific list of genes that you want to take a closer look at. Um, so yes, we do go as large as the whole human genome, or mouse genome, as small as one gene at a time, or anything and everything in between. Um, there was another question here that I wanted yeah, to Jeff, to bring back that question specifically, um, because I don't think I addressed it. For the multi-guide, all of the Syndigo multi-guides of the gene knockout kit are libraries, either the standard libraries or the on-demand libraries. The actual designs are for protein coding genes only. So right. if you're looking for non-coding RNA, microRNA, um, we do not have designs for those. You will have to design those on your own. But if you are targeting uh, coding genes or protein coding genes, we do have designs already made for you. Right, yeah, great point to clarify. Um, maybe should have made that assumption a bit more clear, but you know, that, that seems to be the case that most researchers are more interested in, in protein coding sequences anyway. Um, but yeah, if you are working in some non-coding regions, we can still help you out with the synthesis so you can prepare the, the synthetic sgRNA for you. You would just have to specify what is the sequence that you want us to make. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see. I see some people, uh, a couple of people mentioning that they want to get started with the, with the kits soon. So that's awesome. I'm sure we'll be in touch via tech support to help you get up and running if you have any questions. Um, Anyway, I see we're already 10 minutes past the hour. So Mike, any last comments that you want to share? 
Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciated this. I, it was an enjoyable experience. Thank you everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you everybody. Once again, I know that there are a few questions that we didn't get around to, so apologies if I uh, skipped over you. Um, but if you do still have other questions, uh, Mike, if you wanna go back to the last slide, um, again, we'll leave some links up here for you. Um, you can either reach out to our support team, that'll put you in touch with Mike or one of our other tech support specialists. Um, if you have questions about our bioinformatics tools or um, optimizing transfection, for example, or if you want to book a call with uh, me, if you're in Boston or one of your local account managers, if you're elsewhere, synthigo.com slash discovery. We're happy to help you get up and running with your experiments. Whether you're doing libraries like we talked about today, or again, definitely check out the other sessions tomorrow. We're going over um, cell and engineering, uh, making knockout or knock-in clones, both high quality and high scale. Um, or on Thursday, if you're moving into the clinic, um, then we'll also be discussing GMP grade sgRNA. But with that, uh, once again, thank you to everyone for joining. Thank you to Mike for uh, speaking and thank you to uh, my colleagues at Synthigo for helping put this together.